Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I am Ben Reynolds, host and organizer of today's presentation. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation. We are delighted to offer this educational presentation about birds, nature, culture, and vent tours. We hope that you enjoy today's topic on East and West and a New Germany, Birds and Art in Berlin and Brandenburg by Rick Wright. During this session, all attendees may download handouts and ask questions, but please note that questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. However, if you have any technical questions during the session, I'll try my best to answer them in real time so you have the best viewing experience. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on demand anytime at your convenience. A link to the recording will be delivered to you in an email in the next few days. Now, back to our feature presentation. This presentation will be delivered by Rick Wright. Rick Wright is a widely published author and sought after lecturer and field trip leader. A native of Southeast Nebraska, Rick studied French, German, philosophy, and life sciences at the University of Nebraska before making a detour to Harvard Law School. He took the PhD in German languages and literatures at Princeton University in 1990, then spent a dozen years as an academic, holding successive appointments as assistant professor of German at the University of Illinois, reader in art and archeology span at Princeton University, and associate professor of medieval studies at Fordham University. His numerous scholarly publications include two books on the Latin animal literature, of the latter Middle Ages. Among Rick's recent books are the ABA Field Guide to Birds of New Jersey and ABA Field Guide to the Birds of Arizona. His Peterson Reference Guide to American Sparrows was published in 2019. Especially interested in the history and culture of birding, he is hard at work on a study of hummingbird collecting in France from the 16th to the 19th centuries. Rick has been leading vent tours for six years that combine birds, nature, and culture. He lives in Northern New Jersey with his wife, Allison Berenger, their little girl, Avril, and their chocolate lab, Gellert. We are thrilled to have Rick present about East and West in a new Germany. Without further ado, I will turn the controls over to Rick. Thank you, Ben. I remember my first trip by train to Berlin well. It was in the mid 1980s, not so very long ago, but long ago enough that it was in fact a visit to West Berlin. Back then, West Berlin was still a politically, geographically, socially, and militarily isolated exclave, a hundred long miles from the rest of West Germany. Early on that dim morning, we passed the checkpoint at Helmstedt with a shiver of anxiety. In the days of the Cold War, this was enemy territory. And the stern, pallid faces of the 18-year-old East German border guards seemed determined that we not forget it. The inspection was not the perfunctory glance at a document and a quick look through the luggage racks that we were used to. This, we were given to understand, was serious, the real thing, and no funny business would be permitted. So there was no funny business. And soon enough, we were on East German soil, headed east. The conversations that had dwindled to a tense silence during our inspection at the border started up again. But what was truly captivating was not inside our little compartment, but just outside its smudgy windows. The North German plain was scoured by the glaciers of the Pleistocene which on each of their withdrawals left behind vast areas of sand, the stuff of the dunes of the Baltic and North Sea shores. The glaciers lingered longest in the eastern portions of the plain. On their final retreat about 14,000 years ago, they exposed a soggy landscape of low-lying grasslands, fens, and ponds, reaching from the upper Elbe River to the Oder and beyond into modern Poland. And that was the landscape I was seeing for the first time a landscape never suited topographically 
to heavy industry or intensive agriculture, a landscape seemingly frozen in time by the accidents of history, politics, and economics that had placed it on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. An undeveloped landscape in the best, richest, most promising sense of the word. And a landscape that was obviously full of birds. From the train that drizzly spring morning we saw as apparent breeders, birds I knew in Western Germany only as migrants or winterers, or not at all. Montague Harriers, Hoopos, Hooper Swans, and above all, the Cranes. As a Nebraska boy, I'd seen a crane or two or 500,000 in my time. And one of the seasonal highlights of living in Western Germany was the flights in spring and fall of common cranes on their way between Spain and the Eastern breeding grounds. And now here I was on those very breeding grounds. All along our route that morning, we saw pairs of cranes on the marshes and low fields, stalking out the boundaries of their nesting territories on long, stiff legs. By the time we reached Berlin, my resolve was firm. Someday, somehow, I was going to bird East Germany. At the time, that hope seemed a bit misty, a little wistful, as if I'd set my sights on one day luring a chattering, squawking flock of Archaeopteryx to my backyard feeder. Then came November 1989. The next month saw the reunification of the German states, the conversion at par of the German mark, and the removal of the seat of the German government from Bonn to Berlin. A series of changes so massive and so rapid that 30 years later, confusion and hurt political feelings still linger in some quarters. Myself, I still find it disorienting to think of Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Croatia, as Central European, which of course is what those areas were before 1945 and what they are again today. For birders, that sudden eastward shift of Europe's center of geopolitical gravity opened a vast swath of territory that had been essentially inaccessible to most of us for 40 years. And idle dreams like mine on that first train ride came true. I've now been birding Eastern Germany for more than a quarter of a century and every visit brings with it new discoveries. There was concern in the early 1990s, reasonable concern, that all of the changes and all of the money, vast amounts of money, flowing eastward into what were delicately labeled the new federal states, less delicately, the former East Germany, there was concern that the economic stimulus rushing into the region would bring with it an excess of westernization fancy cars and department stores and urban gloss and glitter, displacing all that was good about life in old East Germany. The fear was that the new federal states would come to look exactly like the old federal states of West Germany, wealthy, modern, and soulless. Some of the loudest alarms were sounded by conservationists on both sides of the former border, who feared that the Eastern portions of this newly unified Germany would come to look like the Western, with nature largely confined within the neat and tidy borders of discrete preserves, rather than dappling a larger landscape. Happily, whatever other failings were attendant on German reunification, the conservation of plants, animals, and habitats was explicitly made part of many plans. And today, the landscapes of the Eastern states, far from pristine, still feature a productive patchwork of extensive agriculture, formal wildlife refuges, farming villages, lakes and marshes, and provincial towns. It's charming. A glimpse, I always think, of rural Europe as it was before the Second World War. But it pays to remember that that charm is in part the result of a history, short term and long, of relative poverty. Large stretches of this landscape survive because people over the centuries have lacked the resources to alter it. For birds and visiting birders, though, it's a wonder. And it's made all the more wonderful by the fact that smack dab in the middle of it all is Berlin, once again the capital of a unified Germany, politically divided for more than 40 years into East and West, and for almost 30 of those years physically bisected by concrete barbed wire booby traps, attack dogs, and nervous pimply-faced adolescents with military firearms. 
Between its erection in the summer of 1961 and its fall in November 1989, the wall would claim the lives of 140 Germans killed in the attempt to pass from one side to the other. And it would divide countless families and destroy countless careers on both sides. Today, there is a whole generation for whom all that is no longer memory, but history. And Berlin is full of history. Young by European standards, the city dates its founding to the mid 13th century. What might have just been another minor provincial settlement would quickly become a commercial center, the seat of the Margraves of Brandenburg, then of the kings in Prussia, then of the kings of Prussia, then of the empires of Germany, the government of the Weimar Republic, the vicious fascist dictatorship of the Nazis, the repressive communist regime of East Germany, and finally, or at least currently, the parliamentary and executive branches of the Federal Republic. Each of these epochs, the glorious, the gritty, and the gruesome alike, has left its mark on the artistic and architectural face of Berlin and on the startling wealth of natural habitats right in the city itself. The grandest of those urban habitats is the Kosa Tiergarten, the great garden of the beasts. 520 wooden acres, the Tiergarten started life five centuries ago as the private hunting preserve of the Brandenburg princes. In the middle of the 18th century, Frederick the Great, fonder of flute recitals and witty French conversation than of boar hunts, opened the forest to the public. In the 1930s, Hitler and his henchmen, including the neat chief Nazi architect Albert Speer, began a redesign of Central Europe. They moved the victory column to the center of the Tiergarten, and they reconceived these forests and gardens as lavish pathways within a sinister new complex of government buildings to serve as the capital of a Nazified Europe. Those plans had been long abandoned by the time the Russian army reached Berlin in 1945. The devastation wrought on the city in the final weeks and months of the war extended to the Tiergarten, which is stripped of its trees by bombing and by city residents in dire need of firewood. The adjacent Berlin Zoo, one of the most comprehensive and one of the most famous in Europe, became a desperate source of protein for Berliners and occupying soldiers alike, with grave and long lasting effects on the populations of some rare species, among them the European bison commemorated in this memorial statue tucked away in the gardens. The Tiergarten has been restored and revegetated, and Germany's third largest public park now serves our vent groups as a backyard birding site and a lovely green corridor for our excursions to the Brandenburg Gate, the Parliament Building, the Victory Column, and the other historic localities within a few hundred yards of our hotel. We typically devote two mornings in the Tiergarten to concentrated birding as a group, but for many of us, some of the most memorable moments there are had on our way to somewhere else or on impromptu solitary walks squeezed in between our scheduled group activities. The range of bird species encountered in the Tiergarten can be surprisingly broad. We regularly encounter raptors, such as the European sparrowhawk, a small occipiter recalling our sharpshinned hawk, or the common buzzard, the original Budio, sharing the big bulky aspect and roadside habits of the red-tailed hawk. Overhead, we might see a common kestrel, a lovely falcon that nests in the nooks and crannies of the city's churches and other tall buildings, or even a white-tailed eagle, a close relative of the bald eagle that, like the American species, has experienced a heartening population increase in the past couple of decades. Gray herons are common on the wooded ponds, usually one of the first species we encounter on our first walk together. They're shyer than great blue herons, and they often vanish into the vegetated background, becoming visible one by one to the patient observer. Sometimes they're not so shy. The Tiergarten is also one of the best localities in the region for smaller birds. Spring and fall, we see good numbers of migrants, including wagtails, thrushes, kinglets, and finches. The oaks and beeches replanted in the 1950s are now venerable old trees 60 feet tall or more. And Eurasian nuthatches, short-toed tree creepers, and great spotted woodpeckers can be detected as they creep and peck along the trunks and larger limbs. The woodpecker in particular can be conspicuous and confiding, having adapted in part to food sources that can be described only as novel.
not all of our destinations in and around the Tiergarten are as lighthearted. Peter Eisenman's Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe, just around the corner from the Brandenburg Gate, is a powerful and deeply unsettling reminder of what a sophisticated and civilized people is capable of. Out of respect for the victims memorialized here, and in an effort to keep individual reactions private, we don't usually visit as a group, but all of us peel off at one point or another to pay our respects. We do visit another less well-known memorial together, typically on the way to our first evening meal. Simpler, much less monumental than the more memorial to the murdered Jews, the memorial to the Sinti and Roma peoples of Europe commemorates the hundreds of thousands murdered in the so-called gypsy camps at Auschwitz and the other Nazi death camps. With a shallow circular pond approached across an unevenly sloping pavement of flat stones, this memorial is a deliberately and profoundly disorienting, destabilizing way into the history of a city that is simultaneously so wonderful and so sinister. Last fall, as we stood pondering in the gathering gloom of evening, a single European robin came in to drink from the pool and sing, a moment of incongruity mentioned by several of us as among the trip's most poignant. At the other end of our street, 20 minutes from our hotel, stands another juxtaposition of the natural and the cultural. Charlottenburg Palace was built at the very end of the 17th century for Sophie Charlotte, wife of the Elector of Brandenburg, who would later have himself crowned Frederick I King in Prussia. The palace itself, in a state of what seems to be perpetual renovation, is one of the most visually pleasing Baroque residences in Germany, and several of the rooms are now in use for concerts and recitals. Two years ago in the Silver Salon, we heard a performance by chamber orchestra and piano, and sleigh bells, of course, of Mahler's Fourth Symphony, a delightful or slightly anachronistic evening's entertainment. As charming as the palace is, it's the grounds that usually draw our attention. A Baroque garden in the formal French style leads down from the palace steps to a lake where mandarin ducks and tufted ducks feed beneath the overhanging branches. This duck, an apparent hybrid between the tufted and the ringneck ducks, was one of the more interesting finds on a recent visit. On the other side of the lake, manicured symmetry gives way to an untidy wildness of willow-lined streams, woodpecker stumps, and stands of tall trees. Eurasian wrens, black caps, and Eurasian tree sparrows can be counted on here. And in fall migration, the skies can be full of hawfinches, red wings, field fares, chaffinches, and Eurasian siskins. The star of the Charlottenburg show, though, is the Berlin specialty, the Northern Goshawk. Forty pairs of this dramatic and supremely secretive raptor nest within the city limits. We've encountered this sought after bird at several sites around Berlin, but the wooded grounds of Charlottenburg Palace seem to be the most nearly reliable site for actually seeing this fine beast. Two years ago, we had to look for our goshawks elsewhere. The wind was strong when we left the hotel that morning, and by the time we arrived at the palace just those few minutes later, the gusts were ferocious, so ferocious that the garden gates were locked, lest any of that wonderful wooded habitat wind up on our heads. But there aren't many places better to have something like that happen than Berlin. We simply paused for coffee and cake. Then we walked across the street to wait the storm out in one of the fine small museums that this neighborhood of Berlin is so famous for. Some of us to the Museum of Modern Art, others to the Brohan Collection of Art Nouveau and Art Deco, others to the creepy Museum of Surrealism, others to the storehouse of plaster casts of classical sculpture. When we were ready for a hearty lunch at Charlottenburg's best Italian restaurant, we stepped outside to find that the wind, still blowing, had blown a flock of tundra bean geese into the city skies. Our bird list that day was short, but what a day we'd had. Birds, art, weather, food, excitement, good company, a perfect combination. With more than 40 officially recognized nature preserves within the city limits, it would be easy to spend an entire tour every day right in Berlin, but the countryside around, which had so enchanted me on my first visit those many years ago, always lures us out into more rural landscapes. 
the palms and other wetlands that birds and birders find so irresistible today had a different, more practical appeal to one group of entrepreneurs in the High Middle Ages. Founded in Burgundy at the end of the 11th century, the religious order of the Cistercians founded its first monasteries in German-speaking lands a short generation later, and by the end of the 12th century, its houses for men and for women were among the wealthiest institutions and the largest landowners in Central Europe. The Cistercians were, and they remain today, a very industrious order, famous for everything from book production to metallurgy to horse breeding and fish. Everywhere that they established their monasteries, the Cistercians were renowned raisers of carp, reared in long ponds dug by the peasants and lay brothers. Today, thousands upon thousands of those ponds survive from France to Poland, from England to Italy. Some are still used for pisciculture, others are derelict and overgrown. Others though, such as the vast pond complexes in Burgundy and in Southern Poland, have been transformed into wildlife preserves and they are always among the birdiest localities in the neighborhood. As a bonus, the Cistercian sites that we visit from Berlin still prefer, preserve a selection of those medieval buildings, giving us a glimpse of the life of a religious community as it was lived from the high middle ages up to the Napoleonic secularization of 1806. One of the best autumn spots that we bird is Altfriedland, a former Cistercian nunnery an hour and a half's drive from our hotel at the Tiergarten. The convent's long ago wealth, grounded in the dowries brought to the order by the daughters of noblemen, is still apparent today in the cloister's remaining medieval buildings and in its many fish ponds. Nestled in the heart of what is popularly known as the Saxon Switzerland, Altfriedland is a tiny village dominated by the production and sale of fish, mostly carp, but also trout and eels. The nine small ponds still dedicated to raising fish are surrounded by stands of common reed, home to common and great reed warblers, water rails, European kingfishers, and even the occasional pendulum tit. The larger lakes though, the Kitzase and the Klostase, are where the action is, especially in the fall. The resident great crested and little grebes and common moorhens share the open waters of these lakes with hordes of migrant waterfowl. Eurasian widgeon, common teal and northern shovelers are usually the most abundant ducks, but there are also common golden eye, red crested and common potchards and tufted ducks out in the massive flocks. The geese are even more impressive. In most years, tundra bean geese dominate, but there are also Canada geese, gray lag geese, greater white fronted geese, even the odd bar headed goose. And the noise when the local white headed eagles visit as they inevitably do is almost beyond belief. The oldest Cistercian foundation in Brandenburg, dating from 1180, is Lenin. Lenin, like several other former monasteries in the area, is now occupied by a hospital and a nursing home run by Lutheran deaconesses. We see birds here. We see yellow hammers. We see European jays. We see great tits. But our time at Lenin is invariably dominated by the architectural landscape created nearly a thousand years ago. The church, funded by the Emperor Otto I, is a masterpiece of red brick. Built, enlarged, and remodeled over the 12th and 13th centuries, this church had fallen into ruin by the 18th century, but it was restored in the early 1870s. The most interesting furnishings to survive are a 16th century altarpiece, the 14th century gravestone of Otto VI, and cemented into the chancel steps, a portion of the tree beneath which, in the year 1180, Otto I received the divine inspiration to found the monastery. But it is the cool, high, open space of the nave that makes the most lasting impression. This is a genuine masterpiece of the Northern Romanesque. On the other side of Berlin, north and east towards the Polish border, stands another Cistercian house, Korin. Eighty years younger than Lenin, Korin was the first Gothic red brick church built in Brandenburg. There were no, brown, no bounds to its architect's ambition. The grand scale of the monastic complex here rivaled that of many foundations in Burgundy, and the west front of the church is as tall and ornate as the facades of most of Germany's stone churches from the period. With the Reformation, Corinne, like the country's other Catholic religious houses, was dissolved, and the buildings fell into disrepair. 
By the mid 19th century, Corinne was a ruin, a favorite destination for romantic painters and writers. Unlike Lenin, Corinne has never been rebuilt, but rather stabilized, such that the long high nave is open to the south, creating a one of a kind backdrop to weddings, concerts, and art shows. The open design is just as welcoming to birds. Rare is the visit to Corinne without the accompaniment of a black red starts cheerful scratchy song echoing from the rafters. Medieval buildings are not the only things to require restoration and stabilization. The one bird I most wanted to see on my long ago train trip to Berlin was the one I knew I would not. By the 1980s, there were only 50 great bustards left in Germany down from the 3,400 tallied just before the outbreak of the Second World War. The species was gone entirely from the West, and it held on in just a narrow strip of that agricultural habitat between Magdeburg and Berlin. Even there, the bustard remained a bird of mystery. I knew no one who had seen them, and I never expected that I would. In a bitter paradox, German reunification, for all the good it did conservation efforts in the East, also posed new dangers to the bustard. New agricultural methods, taller transmission lines, towers, windmills, more cars, more roads, more traffic, would certainly lead to increased disturbance of these shy birds and a fragmentation of their surviving habitat. A big issue if you happen to be a bird that feeds and migrates on foot. The matter became acute in the 1990s. The decision to return the seat of German government to Berlin was inevitable, but it also meant that the new capital was far from the most developed, that is to say the Western regions of the newly reunified country. For understandable reasons, East Germany had not invested in the construction of high quality, high capacity roads between Berlin and the Western enemy. And the city's airports were cramped and awkwardly located. Worst of all, the railroad structure was badly outdated, making it impossible to safely run modern high-speed trains on the old tracks. So a plan was devised to build a new railroad line from Hanover in the west to Berlin in the east with multiple ICE trains a day. The only problem, the bustards. The tracks would pass right through the breeding and wintering areas of one of the surviving flocks, 30 birds, then representing more than half of the country's entire population. Not only would the new rail line destroy the continuity of the habitat, but it would be impossible for these big stolid birds to get out of the way of a train moving at 185 miles an hour. Habitat fragmentation is bad enough, but the prospect of bustards lying dead between the rails was destined to be a public relations disaster. The extreme solution, rerouting the line entirely around the Bustard range, was rejected almost immediately. It was replaced by a plan to run the tracks through a four mile tunnel as they passed through the flock's preferred breeding area. Most parties were pleased until the price tag of 500 million euros was made public. Ultimately, the engineers came up with a system of high steep embankments that lined the tracks along the most sensitive stretches. The idea is that the bustards will be reluctant to climb the slopes, but when they do, driven by hunger or hormones, they can fly from one side to the other, safely above the tracks and the dangerous trains. The other acute challenge, one that persists today, is an increase in the number of mammalian predators in the region. Adult bustards, of course, have nothing to fear. These birds stand three feet tall, they have seven foot wingspans, and they can weigh up to 40 pounds. That's 20% heavier than the typical mute swan. Adult great bustards shrug at danger. The chicks, though, are a different matter. Foxes and ravens have always preyed on newly hatched bustards, a natural act by native animals that had no lasting effect back when bustard populations were high. But when each chick makes up a large percentage of the total number of bustards, and when ecosystems are disrupted by the introduction of such fierce non-natives as these raccoon dogs, the risks are grave. It looked very much as if the bustard would be definitively extirpated from Germany. It was time for drastic measures. 
taking up an experimental method first tried out in the 1960s, the ornithological field station at Buko, with the support of the federal state of Brandenburg and a very active and engaged conservancy group, began to systematically collect clutches of bustard eggs that had been accidentally exposed by agricultural activities, especially springtime haying. Thus exposed, those eggs would most likely be lost to predators or weather. The female bustard lays a second clutch. The eggs collected from the fields are incubated and hatched, and the chicks are then released into vast tracts of grassland surrounded by predator-proof fencing. Once the birds have fledged, and if conditions are right in the surrounding habitat, the gates are left open, letting them come and go as they please until they rejoin the flock containing their own estranged parents. This strategy has worked, and Germany's great bustard population, though it's still restricted to the three traditional areas in Brandenburg and on the border with Saxony, that population is now approaching 300 individuals. The techniques refined by the Buko station are now being used in the UK, where bustards from Russian stock are being released on the Salisbury Plain. The great bustards are once again a source of local pride for many communities in the former East Germany. Not all of them are quite certain just what a great bustard is. We are, though, and our search for the species on the wide open fields is one of the most exciting days on our tour. Finding the birds is never a sure thing, but somehow we've lucked into one or the other of the flocks every time so far. The trick in autumn is to look for extensive rape plantings. When the birds are present, they're often conspicuous in the low seedlings, and there's usually no problem in pausing on the roadside to admire them as they loaf just a couple of hundred yards away. Spring is a different matter. The displaying males, like great cumulus clouds fallen to earth, can be easier to locate, but they're often much farther from the roadside or from the observation platform. And we make a point of leaving as soon as there's any sign that these breeding birds have seen us. This new popularity of the great bustards is a welcome thing, but it's far overshadowed still by the cultural prominence of two other bird species in Brandenburg, the white stork and the common crane. White storks have left for their wintering grounds in Africa or Iberia by the time our fall tour gets underway. In spring and in summer though, these living fairy tales of a bird are common and conspicuous on fields and pastures where they methodically stalk anything alive to feed themselves and their young. Still fairly uncommon and quite local in Western Germany, in the East, storks are a part of an extensive agricultural landscape that never vanished. And long before they were protected by laws, storks enjoyed the safety afforded by tradition, superstition, and just plain fondness in the farm villages where they placed their nests. One little town, Linum, has gone so far as to rename itself on its city limit signs. It is not just Linum, but Storchendorf Linum, the stork village of Linum. Even when the storks are not in residence, it's easy to see why the village should have rechristened itself. 20 or more chimneys in this town of 700 human inhabitants are topped by huge stork nests, where each pair raises as many as four chicks each year. They can be seen all around town and in the surrounding countryside, sometimes in unlikely settings. You may think a ping pong playing stork is quite a marvel, but I beat this one three out of four. Lenum claims that 80,000 tourists visit the village each year to see the storks. And on a fine Sunday afternoon in June, it's easy to believe that number. The long migrations of these white storks have been known since at least the days of the prophet Jeremiah. The first physical evidence, though, of where they go was found north of Lenum in late May of 1822. A white stork appeared at a nest atop a thatched roof in the little village of Plitz. Something was sticking out of the poor bird's neck. The wounded stork was collected, and the offending object was determined to be an arrow of a type produced only in Central Africa, thus demonstrating beyond a doubt the extent of the white stork's annual travels. Astonishingly, over the rest of the 19th century, two dozen more white storks in Germany were found to be carrying similar arrows in their bodies. I look every time 
but so far I haven't found one myself. As impressive as the Lenum Stork Show is, it pales in comparison to the other avian invasion for which the village is famous, the autumn staging of the common crane. Good numbers of cranes are present all over Brandenburg from March to November, but in late September, they all pour into the fields and wetlands surrounding Lunum, where they are joined by families and flocks from Poland, Russia, and Scandinavia to lay on fat before continuing their long flight to the wintering grounds. Numbers peak in early October, with high counts ranging from 20 to 70,000 common cranes gathering at roost. Our schedule is such that we seldom see all of those birds at once, morning or evening, but the sight and above all the sound of even just a few thousand cranes is unforgettable. Thanks to this autumn congregation, Lenum's ecotourism economy steams ahead for most of the year, with storks in spring and summer, cranes in the autumn crane season. There are even now observation platforms and roadside pull-offs for crane watchers. Those pull-offs are taken full advantage of by the local curious and increasingly by international visitors. As a bonus, Lenum is also home to a large complex of fish ponds with good paths and bird lines. Birding these ponds as we listen to cranes overhead and geese on the fields nearby is usually our best chance at such special birds as the bearded tit, merlin, or common kingfisher. 35 years ago, through the smudgy windows of a slow train on a dim morning, I watched the ancestors of some of the same cranes that visit Lenum today, and I dreamed of birding Eastern Germany. The world has changed since then. Today, the former East Germany welcomes visitors from all over the world to its fine hotels, its restaurants, its museums, and its concert halls. Good roads, a modernized airport, and yes, the latest high-speed trains make Berlin and its monuments and green spaces as easy a destination to reach as any of the other great European capitals. The world has changed. What hasn't changed though is the profound richness of a visit to this landscape that combines the natural, the cultural, and the historical in ways that are harder to match anywhere else. I once dreamed of birding Eastern Germany. I hope that Vent can make that dream come true for some of you too. Rick, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Now we will ask the audience if they have any questions they would like to ask you. We'll give just a minute for them to, uh, to come in. Well, can you put up the slide again for your upcoming tours? I believe that should be back up. Good, we now see that. Uh, so you you have two different tours. You have one in the fall and one in the spring. Um, That's and, right. And you you went over some of the differences uh, within your presentation. Will you give a, a brief summary of those uh, individually? Of course. The fall tour is really all about cranes and migrating waterfowl. We do see decent numbers of passerines migrating over. It varies from year to year. In some years, we see huge numbers of haw finches and Eurasian jays. In other years, smaller numbers. But we can always count on yellow hammers. We can always count on missile thrushes and field fairs. So the fall tour is really a migration event. The spring tour, which doesn't start until the very end of May, is dedicated more closely to the breeding birds of the area. And this part of Germany has a, a very strong easterly component to its breeding birds. One of the large areas of polders that we visit on the Polish border, for example, has great reed warblers, it has red crested potchards, it has lesser spotted eagles, and it has great gray shrikes. Um, the real prize, though, of the spring tour is the chance to see the thrush nightingale. West of Berlin, it's all common nightingales, east of Berlin, thrush nightingales. And one of my favorite spots to see the thrush nightingale is also one of my favorite spots for woodpeckers. We regularly see lesser spotted, middle spotted, great spotted, green and black woodpecker 
at the same spot while we're looking and listening for missile thrushes. So the principal difference is that the first event, the first tour is, is the fall tour um, focusing on migration, the spring tour, the second tour, focusing more on the breeding birds of the area. Wonderful, thank you for that summary. Uh, we have a, a question here about the storks. Uh, is the ping pong tourney, is that in the spring or the fall tour? <laughs> That's in spring. That's in spring. In fall, the storks are in Egypt licking their wounds. Good. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we'll ask the audience if there's any other questions. Uh, I haven't received too many more in, but let's take a moment to announce our upcoming webinar. This will be Panama's Canopy Camp, the Darien Adventure with Eric Brunke. That'll be October 1st, uh, the same time slot. Lovely Panama, among the world's most biodiverse countries, this is a must visit destination for birders. In particular, the lowland forests of the Darien region stands out. Here in easternmost Panama, the extravagance of tropical birds representing Central and South American avifauna is complemented by equally remarkable blend of habitats from dense rainforests to winding waterways, all filled with hawks, eagles, macaws, hummingbirds, trogons, tanagers, and much more. Vent visits the Darien twice a year, and the centerpiece of our tours is a stay at the unique Canopy Camp, featuring a luxurious African-style tent lodging experience. The camp serves as a marvelous base for exploring this overlooked corner of Central America. Join Vent Tour Leader Eric Brunke as he showcases the natural history wonders of the Darien and the unique qualities of the Canopy Camp, whether birding by dugout canoe, taking a casual stroll along rainforest roads, seeking the renowned Harpy Eagle, or simply savoring the oasis of the camp, birding the Darien region of Panama is sure to captivate. Oh, and it looks like I did, I got the date wrong on this slide here, everyone. That is 20. No, that's correct. That's when our webinar is going to be. And we will talk about when our tours are in the future at the, at the webinar. Uh, here is a question for us, Rick. Could you, yes. um, could you talk about the food on the tour? What are the, some of the food highlights? Uh, the food is very good in Berlin. Uh, Berlin is a capital city. It is full of embassies and consulates, and its restaurant um, its restaurant landscape is is extremely rich. Um, the first evening, we often try and eat in the restaurant in the dome of the Parliament Building. That's a sort of um, nouvelle cuisine kind of restaurant. I tend to have a heartier appetite, but it's still a, a nice thing to do to sit there and watch the lights come on in Berlin as we as we look out over the city. Um, we also eat at um, at Czech restaurants. We eat at German restaurants of the old style. Um, we eat at um, at a Moravian restaurant, which is very interesting. The food is very good. It's very abundant. Um, the breakfast at our hotel is is more than lavish. Another question here: um, Are there any hints about when EU travel might open up to Americans? No, um, unfortunately, there are not. Uh, it's impossible to be certain of anything, but we can always be hopeful. Um, the um, the next Berlin tour is a full year off, and I'm I'm very hopeful that that we will be permitted once again to to enter germany and the rest of the eu but um as of this morning there was no there was no date set and i don't imagine there'll be a date set much before the beginning of, of the new year another question here are the cultural attractions visited the same on the on the spring and the fall tours Yes, they are. Um, we try and, and make certain that everyone gets to see the largest, most important museums and most important historic buildings in, in the city. There is some free time for people who want to visit one or the other of the smaller 
museums on their own. Everyone, um, it seems every year, has a, a little tiny specialty museum that they want to go to, and so they're able to. But yes, we all go to the um, the great museums of the Museum Island, which includes the Neues Museum with the famous bust of Nefertiti, um, the Pergamon Museum, of course, with the Pergamon altar and the um, the, the marketplace of Miletus. We all go to the Museum of Applied Arts to see the medieval treasury of the Guelph Dukes. And we all go to the, um, the, the National Painting Gallery, which is one of Europe's finest, finest museums for, for painting from the Middle Ages up until the 19th century. Are there opportunities to attend music events? It's a bit difficult to be honest because our spring tour comes after the um, the main season has closed and our fall tour is usually right at the beginning of the of the season for the opera, the symphony, and other concerts. Um, smaller musical groups do perform all year round, and we always keep an eye out for um, for those concerts, many of which are announced at at quite short notice. For example, I think that I mentioned the um, the Mahler Symphony that we heard in a in a chamber orchestra arrangement at Charlottenburg a couple of years ago. Um, the signs for that did not go up until after we had all arrived in Berlin, but we were still able to get tickets and to have a, a very enjoyable evening. So there is the the caveat that the musical offerings of Berlin are not as as wide or as deep. Um, in early October and in late May as they are at other times of the year, but there is certainly music available. We have a follow-up question about food. Um, they're asking uh, about vegetarian options of food. Uh, is that prevalence along uh, the different stops in the tour? Vegetarianism is a really big deal in Germany. It has been for the last generation. So virtually every restaurant offers a wide range of vegetarian options and those restaurants that don't offer vegetarian options unfortunately we don't take advantage of as a group so yes there are always vegetarian options and often quite a wide variety of such options and how many participants are allowed on each of the tours i believe that's <laughs> I believe I'm going to have to send you to the um, to the website for that. Um, I think I, Germany yes. and art in Berlin and Brandenburg. I believe that's uh, is it eight are on that one, and then Germany in spring, birds and art in Berlin and Brandenburg uh, is co-led with your wife Allison, and that allows fourteen. Right. Very good. Okay. So the fall tour with just the one leader, me eight and the spring tour with me and Allison um, co-leading is open to 14 registrants. Well, and I believe that concludes the questions. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ben, for putting this together. Have a good day. Goodbye.